Hi, I'm your host, Michael Fox. So, like last week when we went to Guatemala for an update on the inauguration of that country's new president, this week is also going to be a little different. I've been covering the elections in El Salvador. The country's president, Nayib Bukele, was re-elected on Sunday, February 4th, and there is so much to say. I want to start by just diving right in. I'm first going to play for you a radio story I filed for the world. It ran on Monday, February 5th, the day after the vote. I then sit down in El Salvador's capital, San Salvador, with Dartmouth Assistant Professor of Latin American Studies, Jorge Cuellar. If you've been listening to this podcast, you'll remember him from episodes four and five, which looked at the Civil War in El Salvador and Radio Venceremos. Finally, at the very end of the episode, I have a bit of an update on rather concerning news from El Salvador's Supreme Electoral Court and the vote count. Okay, here's the show. Supporters of Nayib Bukele danced and cheered last night in El Salvador's main plaza. Among them was Teresa Vasquez. She wears a scarf with a slick cartoon image of 42-year-old Bukele in sunglasses. I'm happy because we're enjoying true freedom, she says. I'm 67 years old and we've never had a president like we have today. Bukele has amassed an almost fanatical fan base and they turned out for him on election day. The vote itself was relatively without incident. People made their choice for president and legislative assembly. But there were issues. Political campaigning is usually prohibited on the day of the vote. But on Sunday, billboards and banners of Bukele's party Nuevas Ideas, New Ideas, draped across roadsides and filled the streets in front of voting centers. Outside polling stations, Bukele supporters cheered for their president and even directed some voters how to vote for Bukele or New Ideas candidates. During his first term, Bukele's party in Congress ousted five Supreme Court justices and appointed a new court. The new justices reinterpreted the Constitution, enabling Bukele to run for an unprecedented second term. This election is unconstitutional, one voter told me. He declined to give his name for fear of reprisals. As citizens, we have the right to come and vote, but that doesn't mean that it's constitutional, he said. But that was not an issue for most at the polls. For every other Salvadoran I spoke with on Election Day, one thing shined above all the rest. Security. Vilma Perez is a retiree. She wears a blue Bukele hat with the image of the president. Slick back hair, manicured beard, leather jacket, and aviators. Now we have so much security, she says. We can go anywhere in the country without being afraid. That has been Bukele's greatest achievement. Two years ago, he instituted a state of emergency, suspending habeas corpus and the rule of law. It's enabled state security forces to detain and jail 70,000 alleged gang members indefinitely. But family members of the detained say tens of thousands of those jailed are innocent, and they want their loved ones returned. Last Friday, dozens of mothers and sisters of the detained rallied outside the country's attorney general's office. The attorney general had closed the investigations into 142 deaths of detainees. Enough, Bukele, they shout. They say they're afraid for their loved ones on the inside, and they want the investigations reopened. Reina Hernandez carries a large pink sign which reads, Freedom for my son. They captured my son on May 4, 2022, she says. He's not involved in gangs, he hasn't done anything wrong, he has no criminal record, and that's why I'm here. Analysts say Bukele will likely double down on the harsh measures that have won him so much popularity and he's inspiring others abroad. Outside the main voting center in San Salvador, a group of Peruvians watch a mass of Bukele supporters celebrate the impending victory. They're here on the invitation of Bukele's party. Armando Mendoza is the president of Peru's municipal police force. We're here to copy this very successful security model of President Nayib Bukele, which has shown the world that it can work, he says. 
Ecuador has already started to copy it. Costa Rica wants to copy it. Guatemala, Colombia. In Latin America, everyone wants a Bukele model because it has shown results, he says. During a press conference yesterday, Bukele said he was already exchanging ideas with Argentina's new libertarian president, Javier Milei. Bukele says he's creating a new democracy, though to outside observers, it looks a lot like autocracy, and the majority of the country seems on board. Marcos Lopez has been selling political party t-shirts and flags every election for years outside the voting center where Bukele cast his ballot. A long time ago, we used to sell shirts from the other parties when they were around. But now that there's the official party, that's what we sell, he says. We don't need to sell any of their shirts because people only ask for the official party shirt. It's a telling sign of the uncertain road ahead in El Salvador. Though one thing is for sure, Bukele is in charge and he has a mandate. For The World, I'm Michael Fox, San Salvador, El Salvador. That ran on Monday, February 5th. Now, on to my conversation with Professor Jorge Cuellar. We look at the vote, concerns for the country's democracy, Bukele's re-election, his image, plans, and what it all means going forward. What's up, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Jorge? <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are right now in like the courtyard of the Museum of Word and Image. It's kind of fitting that we're having our little conversation right here in San Salvador. I am honored to be in your presence, Jorge. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, super cool. So Jorge and I have been uh, in San Salvador for the last week. We've been running around town. We've been interviewing a lot of people. We've been seeing a lot of things. Uh, obviously, we were on the ground for the elections on Sunday. Um, and so I wanted to have this uh, little conversation with you to kind of bring people up to speed with where we are now connected to the past uh, and, and, and take a look at, at where we're headed into the future. And, um, and I guess I'll just start, how, how are you feeling? Today? Yeah, well, well, first off, thanks, Mike. It's really good to be here with you, you know, at the, at the Museum of the Word and Image, which has been uh, a sort of, uh, such an important place for safekeeping of country historical memory, um, for reminding people of the Salvadoran past um, in order to, you know, forge a better Salvadoran future. And they're, they're sort of the memory keepers, institutionally at least. Um, and so it's, it's kind of fitting, right, to be here and to be having this conversation with you. And so how do I feel? Um, that's a, I mean, it's a complex one. You know, I'm Salvadoran. Um, I actually went to uh, vote myself with, with my mom. Um, and it was a kind of a weird, weird experience. Um, there was, uh, I mean, I, I'm, right now I'm feeling uh, a bit in a in kind of in, in a suspended period, like a, I'm suspended in time, in the sense that I don't know where this is going because we're in totally, you know, a new political moment that the Salvadoran people haven't experienced, and I myself in my lifetime have never experienced. Um, you know, there's. Uh, dictatorships that have happened in the past, authoritarianism's past, military coups in the past, but this is something totally, totally new. And so my, my feelings around it aren't fully, you know, sort of cemented or articu articulated, but, but I do feel kind of suspended um, uh, uh, because I'm not sure where this is going to end up. Um, and even after, you know, exercising the vote yesterday and seeing, and seeing folks really kind of euphoric about this victory, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of people who have remained silent and, and quiet around, around this moment. Um, we're still re really unclear about the vote count at this point, so we don't know what's happening there. But, but there's a sense that, uh, you know, we sort of, we lie in wait uh, to, as to what's going to happen. And, and I really share that sentiment with, with my co-nationals. Yeah, yeah. I guess, uh, just as context, right? So elections were Sunday, yesterday now. Um, over 1,500 voting centers around the country. Salvadorans hit the polls everywhere. Uh, and obviously the, the, the big person on the ballot is President Nayib Bukele, right, who's been in power for five years. He's running for re-election. Re-election is unconstitutional according to the Constitution. 
uh, but he was able to remove the Supreme Court, put in another Supreme Court, and then they approved it. Uh, and that opened the door for his reelection. There was also a, a shift in the in the Congress, the Legislative Assembly. They changed the number of Legislative Assembly members. And so this now, um, they were voting yesterday for 60 new members of legislature. Uh, also, the, 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 the foreign vote, like the U.S. vote out, out of the country, the diaspora is the first time they've been able to vote, um, which there were some complications online. Voting started at 7 a.m. It ended at 5. Uh, what we know until now is that Bukele had said that a couple hours later, like he would declare his victory, and that's what he did over Twitter, right? Um, we, we still don't have the full results from the tribunal, the Supreme Electoral Court, and we don't know when we will get them. Uh, but Bukele, a couple hours later, said, I've won with 85% of the vote, and I've won 58 of 60 congressional representatives. Uh, and then after the vote, then we, you know, we went to downtown San Salvador, and, and, and Jorge was there to watch his speech. I was busy working. <laughs> yeah, yeah you were it. busy working. I yeah, exactly. Anyway, so that's like that's like the that, that's the that's the big yeah. really quick yeah, context. Yeah. So did yeah. I miss anything in, in terms of like understanding like what what the data no, was I, like? No. We'll dive into the specifics in a second. No, no, no. I think the context is right. Yeah, I think that's precisely what what this uh, what this election has been about. I think you know it's been five years of Bukele, and um, it's a it's a reality that um, has for some people really paid off in the sense that. They feel security, right? And this is what, what really Salvadorans were voting on. Um, Bukele as a sort of steward of country security. This is the main reason Salvadorans took to the ballot box. And as, um, as you said, like, gave Bukele um, like an overwhelming uh, uh, amount of the popular vote. 85%, not, it's not clear yet, even though Sid Gallup had um, also a similar uh, result. But the official results, you know, from the tribunal aren't in yet so we can't we can't be certain that that's the exact figure yet yeah as well Could, before we get dive into like because i'm excited to to kind of walk through election day and and look at our takeaways and what did you see and what were the some of the highlights but um, before we get into that could you give me just a really quick overview of the bukele administration i think it's important for people that don't know that much to like understand what have these last five years meant for el salvador yeah, so when Bukele comes into power in 2019, you have uh, a kind of, this is a breakthrough moment. It's a watershed moment in Salvadoran politics. He's a political outsider, right? Um, he's sort of unknown on the political scene nationally. His previous uh, 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 roles has been, have been as mayor of uh, Nuevo Cuscatlan, um, as well as uh, mayor of San Salvador. Um, and you, you see... You see the people uh, in a situation uh, where where gang criminality is such a norm in these in the country, where people have been uh, you know have an accumulated hurt around gang criminality. Uh, many people have migrated, and Bukele comes in as a sort of messianic figure that is going to rectify all these country problems um, and and do away with them and, and build the new El Salvador. Um, and you see that on some ads, actually. But, uh, 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 and, and what you see, is, in fact, is the way that he approaches this problem is not that dissimilar from uh, politicians before other uh, uh, presidents, right? He, he, he unleashes dur during the pandemic, he, he gets this like, really important opportunity of the, of the pandemic to basically unleash the military and police apparatus all throughout El Salvador in order to deal with the, the sanitary emergency of the pandemic, right? Um, but as well, um, uh, station police officers in strategic locations in order to deal with the gang problem. And so it's a kind of double, double move that, that he's afforded during the, the early pandemic. Um, and through that, he, he, he calls this thing the um, territorial control plan, which is uh, his approach to de combating gangs, right? It, it works, right? It works. And, um, uh, and, he ex and what he does is he asks the Legislative Assembly at that moment in, to give him exceptional powers, right, emergency powers, not only to deal with the pandemic, but also to deal like with the profound sort of structural problem of gangs by, you know, um, uh, um, giving him, uh, 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 what is it, it's a, it's, a, it's a defense bill. It's a defense bill where um, he actually occupies a Legislative Assembly with military in tow in order to pressure the legis Legislative Assembly 
to support the passing of this bill, right? So there's all these sort of moves that he's making in order to ensure that he has the resources, right, to, um, uh, uh, to combat these gangs. And that has been like just uh, scaling up year after year across these four and a half years of Bukele um, to, to, um, to deepen the, the, the repressive and the security apparatus with continual funds, with the upgrading of military equipment, with the buying of tanks, which some Salvadorans were taking pictures of, uh, uh, with actually uh, in, at the celebration yesterday. But it's this kind of uh, uh, sort of fetish, right, around security that Bukele has really seized upon and has made it the hallmark of his administration. And that's what uh, the last four and a half years have been about. But in order to achieve that, there's been this kind of democratic erosion, right? The occupying of the legislative, legislative assembly, the stacking of the constitutional court, as you mentioned, with people that you know, would, will favorably, later favorably interpret the constitution, right, to allow for his reelection. Um, as well as, uh, uh, um, you know, um, um, putting uh, Nuevas Ideas, his party's uh, uh, officials, throughout, you know, El Salvador. And so it's, this, is, this is what uh, has happened over the last four and a half years. And people have been taken by that. They've been really uh, uh, convinced by this. They're, they're enthused about it. They continue to be euphoric um, uh, because there's been concrete results. And that con those concrete results have you know, have come from these uh, uh, like uh, gang sweeps that they've done throughout the country that has led to um, the, the, the overwhelming, you know, like 70,000 people being detained um, uh, in, 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 in through Salvadoran prisons, but also with the building of new ones, right? Like the uh, terrorism containment center um, and, and these other, uh, um, uh, which, you know, has been, uh, uh, has led to uh, huge abuses in human rights, but have nonetheless, you know, people overlooked that because the problem of insecurity was so deep rooted and was such a issue, right, in everyday life. Um, we're going to dive into a bunch of the <laughs> we're gonna get into a bunch of that yeah, stuff in yeah, a second, yeah. um, but I want to start kind of on like dive into election day mm -hmm. yesterday, right? Um, you were on the ground. What did you see? What were some of your takeaways um, from yesterday? I mean, I saw, I saw the Salvadoran people in different contexts. I saw them in, in a rural, a kind of semi-rural context, and also in San Salvador in an urban context. Take to take to the voting centers, you know, with 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 a sort of, it was sort of somber in in many ways. Um, there was a, it was a this the election results were a foregone conclusion. Um, it was already known that Bukele was going to win. It just was a matter of by how much, right? And really the struggle of, of the election was in the Legislative Assembly. So much of what I heard in the people that I spoke to, from taxi drivers to people on the street to standing in line to buy food, right, is, is this idea that, um, uh, that Bukele has done a magnificent, magnificent job, right, in securing, you know, the country. But at the same time, they don't want him to have full power, right, by, by complicating the Legislative Assembly and not giving that fully over to Nuevas Ideas, his party, right? And so it's that, that's, that's one of the main sort of um, nuances, right, that I caught when I was speaking to people. Um, but I think despite that, um, uh, what, what, what was clear is that people were, were still uh, willing to give Bukele, right, and his party, of which is, is an extension of him, right, um, another chance to rectify not only, right, keep the gang members in the prisons, which, you know, they, they, they really did run a fear, a fear campaign in order to ensure that was kind of the dominant uh, 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 issue, right, on the ballot, but also to uh, address economic problems, right, uh, that, have, that have been lingering since the, the pandemic, right, and the spending on, on security and the spending on, um, uh, on, the, on the emergency itself, right, that uh, that is still really impacting um, Salvadoran families. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was I was I was really like kind of shocked and taken aback by the amount of like government propaganda uh, at so many of the polling stations, like in front, 
yeah. <laughs> inside, people's colors, people voting with that. I was an election observer. We talked a little bit about this in the mm -hmm. last couple of days. I was an election observer 20 years ago. And it was that, what was that was really key was to make sure that there was this independence that you couldn't be just, people couldn't be flyering the day of the vote. I mean, obviously there's other countries, they have different realities, but in El Salvador, that was really, really clear. Like mm -hmm. you can't just be promoting people's vote outside. Uh, you can't be directing people from a specific party. Uh, you can't go inside and you couldn't vote with like a specific color shirt, mm -hmm. right? And yesterday I go to the main voting center. I was there right before they opened. Um, and there's this huge Nuevas Ideas banner, banner right yeah. out front. This is the spot that like was downtown in front of the stadium. Yeah. This is where Bukele ended up voting at the very end of the day. But the big banner, and then there's these um, these little these little like uh, what do you call them? Uh, not booths, but these little tables with these little the like canopy, tents, yeah, tent yeah tent little tent canopy tent 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 tent. Yeah, tents. Yeah. And those are all like Nuevas Ideas with the people down sitting down beneath them and I talked to some of them and they and I said, oh, so you guys are getting the vote. I said, no, 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 we're here to just help guide people if they need help. Yeah. So like they would guide them, yeah. but they would be with a, with a Nuevas Ideas flyer mm -hmm. with the, the face of the candidate and then here's your, here's your table yeah. and stuff. And this was all Nuevas Ideas. It yeah. wasn't anybody else, right? Yeah. Yeah. And even inside the colors of, you, you know, in the past you had the, um, <clears throat> the Vigilantes, the people from the different parties who yeah. would be there to watch the vote. Yeah. Um, and, and then you would have like the president of the table who would be like independent. And mm -hmm. this time everyone's wearing, like there were, there were a couple of other parties in there, but mm -hmm. especially in that main voting center, mm -hmm. it was all the sky blue and the white, the bukele colors. Like that yeah. was it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if there was any other color, it was the orange and the, the orange, the Ghana, Ghana. The, the Ghana which is the party that yeah. bukele won. Yeah came to power in five years ago. Yeah. So it was shocking the amount, and even the, that, uh, that main um, voting station that I just mentioned, then you on the other side, you had the, this whole crew of people with Bukele shirts on cheering mm -hmm. and like yelling and setting off fireworks. And this was, all, this was all like institutional, you know? It was all crazy. I was like, I was shocked at the level mm -hmm. of that, uh, that I just didn't even realize. Yeah, it was, re it was really similar in the voting centers that I was in. You had, it was kind of, there was a sort of four to one ratio in terms of, you know, the cyan and blue people and then the rest of the other parties. That's sort of what I more or less calculated as, by, as I was walking through them. Um, there was that, there was an overwhelming presence of that. And yeah, you're right. There, everybody was wearing, uh, uh, you know, the, their, their party's colors. And uh, because of Nuevas Ideas uh, popularity, most of what you saw was cyan and white. Right. So it's, it's, it's exactly right. I think that wasn't the case in other elections past where you couldn't sort of campaign inside a voting center. Right. You couldn't be wearing um, these overwhelming, like very visible colors. I remember people would wear pins um, of their party, but that was sort of subtle. You know, there wasn't uh, this kind of block of, of color that really s singled you out as being a sympathizer of one party or the other. And so you had that. And, and, and that was from I mean, that was like a legacy coming out of the Civil War, right? To ensure that this democratic system was going to work for everybody and nobody was gonna try and step on other people, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So that people wouldn't be influenced, unduly influenced the day of the election, right? This is why you couldn't, uh, you know, you couldn't have, uh, you know, the represent representation of a party right outside, chanting or yelling, uh, you know, slogans and things like that. It was to ensure the integrity of the vote that it didn't, wasn't cast in a kind of manipulative way. Um, but now it, it's a sort of a free for all. It's sort of a free for all, and because of the resources of the state and the sort of the reelection, this is why you have, like you mentioned, right, the flyers that were supposed to be guiding people and helping them to their ballot box. But you know, Nueva Idea. It's it, there's a Nueva Idea sort of monogram on the on the piece of paper, and so this this is uh, this is something new. Um, before those papers that guided people to their uh, polling place and to their ballot box were actually Tribunal Supremo Electoral. So they're tribunal papers. They weren't party, right? And so this, that, even, even at that level, you can see um, that the image of Nuevas Ideas and of Bukele's party and his people um, moves through the electoral process in a way that we haven't seen before. Right, right. And when you say party, it's like, it's not any party. It is only Nuevas Ideas. It is only Nuevas Ideas. Also, I mean, I think it's also important to remember that they were, like, the other parties didn't get any of the, 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 the financial state funding, right? 
Right. Yeah, they weren't funded um, uh, to a degree that they could have representation, right, at the uh, voting centers in the way that Nuevas Ideas did. And so I wasn't at a, a place that had a, a, a municipality that may have been won, let's say, by the FMLN. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that looked like. Right. Maybe it was slightly different. But I, I'm, I'm almost sure that it wasn't um, because the resources that were given for... Uh, you know, sort of the tabling activity outside of the voting centers was coming straight from 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 the party. And since the party um, uh, has an you know a large amount of representation within all all bodies of government, right? Clearly, they you know the state purse was sort of used for 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 that activity. Yeah. So, I guess the question, Jorge, is, is like why is why are we talking about this so much? Why is that important? The reason why it's so important because. If let's say you're plugged out of politics in El Salvador and you're going to the ballot box that day, you would think that it's only Nuevas Ideas running, that only Bukele is running, right? And that the other politicians are kind of non-entities, are a weak opposition, that, you know, this, this is the kind of experience that you have as a voter when you're going to a voting center because all you see is cyan and blue. Right, that light, the light blue, sky blue and, and white, right? That's all you see. And you, you say cyan? Cyan. Cyan. That's, cyan. The, that's, the, that's, that's the name of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. In fact, they call themselves Bancada Cyan, which is like the cyan block, wow. right? Within the Legislative Assembly, they call themselves the cyan block. Wow. And they use that, and they had a hashtag and the whole thing, and they use that as a way to show the kind of collectivity, um, the power of that voting block. Uh, against the other uh, uh, representatives in the in the legislative assembly, and so they use that as a tool to to galvanize people and to support them. Um, so yeah, they they definitely love the color, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> love the color, and we saw it everywhere yesterday. Saw it everywhere. Um, no, go ahead. What no, what I was going to say is that one, another thing is that even beyond the sort of perimeters of the voting center, you rarely saw any political uh, advertisements, uh, uh, flags. Uh, political graffiti on on light posts you didn't see that right and that was a characteristic of Salvadoran elections past that is no longer and this may be because of the state of exception right people are voting in a state of exception where that kind of political graffiti could be possibly misconstrued you know as a violation of public property or something and could be uh, a, a reason for uh, arbitrary detention or whatever, right? Or just being harassed and by police or military. And so it's, it's, it's important too, not only because we're going into a, a different political terrain that Salvadorans have never been into or never entered into, but because this was all happening under already exceptional conditions, right? With this state of exception, which is basically... Uh, you know, an emergency moment, a, a political emergency moment um, that Bukele has continually, uh, 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 you know, uh, prolongated. That. Yeah. When I, one of these days uh, last week, I went up to Cabañas, it's a state nearby. Uh, and in San Salvador, you barely see any of those kind of billboards with like the pictures of different candidates. Once you get outside there, I started to see some. They were almost all from Nuevas Ideas, almost all. And there was none from like the traditional like Frente, Arena parties, obviously. Um, but I thought that was interesting. Once you got outside of San Salvador and like Bukele is still important, but here's the importance of these other candidates in those kind of those yeah, other regional I, areas. Yeah, when I was, um, when I was um, over in San Martin, uh, going towards Suchitoto, in those areas, you see some of the, you know, sort of smaller billboards with uh, um, legislative assembly members' faces on. On them, as well as the um, uh, mayors, that uh, El Salvador is going into a mayoral election in March as well, and so I, you saw some of that, but it wasn't to the to the level that it was before. The kind of sim it was everywhere. Like any wall that had nothing on it had a political uh, had the flag of a political party uh, had something on it. Right? It was in a in a color that would make you think of a political party, but that's no longer the case. Right. And I think just, just the context, we kind of mentioned at the beginning, but like this goes back to 2019, Bukele comes in and completely breaks. There was this two-party kind of system, right? There were other parties, but it was like always back and forth between Frente and Arena, which is the right-wing party. Uh, and then 2019, Bukele breaks this and just rolls in uh, and continues the steamroll till today. I did, there was something that I thought it was interesting interviewing a ton of people at the different voting centers yesterday. 
every single person, like we talked about, like you mentioned, that I spoke with said security was their top thing. I mean, it was like the, it was like, like a model and it's true because it's changed people's lives. You know, this is like, this is, this is, I think, really important context that, you know, we might be concerned about what Bukele uh, has done or is doing with authoritarianism. What is he creating? Like the, 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 the gutting of democratic systems, the, the, the taking over of the different branches of government. But he is, he has changed people's lives like they have never seen before. Like, like literally suddenly people can walk the street at night. Like how many people have repeated this to me so many different times, right? Yeah, no, I ex that's exactly right, Mike. When you, when you live, you know, sort of 20 or so years, right, of gang violence, extortion, right, having to, you know, by, for the sake of survival, having to deal with the presence of gang members, with uh, uh, high homicide rates, with bodies showing up in the middle of roads, you know, these, this is the reality that Salvadorans were living for such a long time. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, Mike, we're going to clear that up for you, that's a compelling argument, right? And, and people, are, people have totally bought into that because the guy has delivered. And we can't discount that, right? We can't discount the sort of material shift that has happened in the, in the popular, you know, vulnerable and poor, marginalized Salvadoran community. People are really living that safety. And so one of the things that I heard often was, we now can breathe tranquility. Podemos respirar tranquilidad. And that to me is such a powerful, you know, sort of formulation of that is kind of a political emotion, right? Yeah. It's a political emotion that people are communicating through uh, this sense of now being able to, like you said, walk the street, go to the store, not be uh, looked at in a, in a certain kind of way that might be suspicious or whatever. So it's this that people are, are really drawn to, right? Because that has been delivered. But alongside that, right, you have this, what, like you're mentioning, the dismantling of democracy, the abuse of human rights, the you know, uh, mass detention and mass incarceration emerging as a kind of industry in El Salvador as well. And so you have this other stuff happening. Um, you have a one-party state, right, and at this point. Um, but, this, but the reality, right, those are sort of abstractions for the regular Salvadoran because the regular Salvadoran only cares about, you know, whether or not they're going to make it to the next day, which was the problem before Bukele, right? And that is what, for Salvadorans, was the um, result of the two-party system that predates him, right? It was, it was, it was shared blame amongst Frente and Arena as being sort of, you know, two sides of the same coin, right? And the two sides of the same coin that also utilized in their own way the gang problem as a, as a fear tactic to, to garner, you know, garner votes. Yeah. Walk me through, I want to walk, uh, uh, the polls close, right? And then people start to make their way to downtown. Walk me, I mean, we, we were there together but walk me through kind of what, what you saw uh, and kind of the feeling on the ground uh, being there like in, in like the minutes and the hours before Bouquet is just about to speak. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I would like to see the photographs to compare the, uh, the size of the crowds because I'm not sure if they were the same, but people were uh, in, a, in, a, in a celebratory mood. They were really happy. They were they were crowded in the sense that th they were being funneled through a checkpoint, a security checkpoint with military, you know, with high caliber weapons and, and police as well. But in general, people, were, you know, they were they were they, it was an orderly, you know, performance of of of, of, of civic, you know, of civic duty. You know, they were walking through and, and and gathering in front of the you know prepared stage by Bukele that was set up really early that morning, so the guy knew he was going to win. Um, and, and, and people were, there, there was joy, there was joy there. Um, and and that's, that's important, like it's, it's, it's tough to, to be critical of it, but what you see is that, you know, folks were really excited about this. They were, they were very happy about this. There were people with flags, there were people with, you know, masks on of Bukele. There were all sorts of, you know, pirated shirts with Bukele's face on it. You know, all this kind of stuff was there. Um, and, and, and the sense was that, you know, this is, this is something that, they felt was actually, even if some people didn't vote for Bukele, was something that they were doing for their fellow Salvadoran, right? And so there was a sense of, 
of, of, of compromiso, right? Of, of, of commitment from the Salvadoran that's pro Bukele to the one that isn't. Because in the end, they feel that they're doing, they're doing the right thing. They're on the right side, right, of, 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 of history in, in a sense. And so that, 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 that sense of the people as a kind of historical actor was really, really was felt in that crowd. Um, and especially as we inched closer and closer to Bukele coming to the stage and to speak, right? So that to me was one of the, the kind of swelling emotion of the crowd. Um, again, but they were very much primed for it, right? They were, they were being, they, they, they entered the discotheque, right? Um, uh, all the music was playing, you know, Daft Punk one more time, right? All this kind of stuff uh, in order to prime people to, to sort of accept, right, what, they, what was going to be presented before them. Yeah. I think it was really interesting. I mean, for me, obviously, I've covered a lot, I've covered a lot of elections, um, and there were major, major similarities between. I mean, almost word for word, when I heard from some of the folks last night, and when I heard um, from a lot of Bolsonaro supporters in Brazil, 2018, 2019. Uh, you know, uh, this is the first time I feel like I'm I voted. You know, or I feel like this is like the first time we actually have a president. Like, we are free now. Um, there were all these kind of layers of feelings and just, you know, e ecstasy, right? Like, so much ecstasy. Not the drug, but the excitement, you know? Like, because people, like, it was, it was on fire. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, I want to get into a little bit this, the, the, the Bukele image, the Bukele, um, uh, the marketing Right, because I think this is so important to understand. I mean, uh, in 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 terms of understanding, like, what is the most important thing? Like, how did Bukele win? You know, we talk about security, but the other thing that he is so good at, right, is 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 the image. It's the story. It's the social media. It's the selfie. Like, how does he? Um, what is his spin? But it's not a spin. It's like it's literally he is kind of like a, a, a market. Like in the same way that the, like you said, the music's playing, it's excitement. We want to bring people in in the same way like if evangelical churches oftentimes are going to play music that's going to get people excited and youth excited to be part of something. And, and, and there was so much of that happening, right? Yeah, there, it's a, I mean, I think the evangelical comparison is so apt. There's a cult-like experience of Bukele. Right. Right. Uh, when Bukele speaks... It seems like, you know, um, the anointed one, the enlightened leader, right, is speaking to you directly as a vessel, as a vessel of God, right? And you can feel that in the crowd, too, especially the way he was moving, you know, different sectors to, to sort of cheer when he was saying one thing versus another, right? So he has those constituencies really, really uh, well-defined and articulated uh, in his discourse, in the way that he speaks to crowds, right? So that, that, that's one way, but this, but this kind of pleasure of belonging, which I think is really critical to the Bukele phenomenon, is not one that just happens in the sort of crowd phenomenon, but it's one that has been cultivated for the last five years, right? And this is where you have the social media, this is where you have uh, the, the, the uh, newspaper, Diario El Salvador, this is where, this could, where the propaganda machine has like, done its work, right? It's primed people for these moments. It's almost like, uh, 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 you know, you're, it's just like leading you up to these uh, climactic, uh, the climax moments, right? Of which the, the elections, you know, really, really are that kind of peak, right? But so for many people, they've been hearing these things for, for such a long time in different ways, packaged through YouTube, packaged through uh, 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 the newspapers, packaged through, you know, clips of Bukele, packaged through his tweets, right? And th that ensemble of stuff, right, is, is the, the marketing plan, right? Um, but one that people have been, you know, drip fed for the last five years, um, right? And, and, even, and, and even before that as a candidate, Bukele. Yeah. So I want to I bring in two things that I noticed over the last week and then dive into his speech because you were there. I had to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I endured it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were there. But I want to I wanna dive into bring in two things that I thought were fascinating over the last week. One of the things we did not see, as we mentioned, in the lead up to the elections was kind of people in the streets getting the vote out you know oftentimes we'd see in the past in this election or in other elections elsewhere as you're used to seeing people with flags and banners whatever the only time i saw that uh was right before the, the like in in el salvador there's a specific 
time, like two or three days beforehand, when there's no campaigning after that. Mm -hmm. And it was that afternoon when this group called Poder Popular, which is a Bukele group, popular power, but it has a whole kind of left progressive discourse, right? And they came out, they came in from different areas and they kind of bust in and they did kind of an hour and a half uh, right in front of Metro Centro in, in San Salvador, this big kind of, uh, this big mall. And they had this huge banner up for Bukele um, and they were handing out uh, calendars and they've got flags and stuff. And what was really fascinating though is they weren't necessarily there to engage the people that were around there, right? They were there for the social media TikTok videos that they were shooting really fast. And, and the director was just taking one after another after another. He must have taken maybe 20 or 25. And then he said he was sending them all to Bukele and to social media so they could spread them out to their, through their networks. So the idea is to show kind of this... Uh, this organic the, popularity. This organic popularity. All these people who are in the streets and they're all there. But it wasn't necessarily for the people that were there. It's like this image over social media. It's the same thing that Bukele talks about. I don't have to go out and knock on doors and campaign. I'm going to send some tweets, man. Like, that's just the way it is. And we saw that also... Uh, actually during the day of the vote with this crew that was outside of the of the main voting center where like the director of these guys is like at one point I was there filming and he t there was this whole line of Bukele supporters kind of in the shade and he's like you guys I'm sorry I know the sun's hot but you guys can't be there because it doesn't look like there's enough of you guys you got to go to the other side where it shows wow. that we have like a we have a, a mass. mass of people you know and like we've got it like so it was all about the image how are mm -hmm. we going to lift this image wow uh you know through social media right because that's all that's what that's all it's about and then of course you know that it was right after that they, they pulled out these you know there's obviously they shot off the fireworks but they actually had you know the the, the, the smoke the, oh the, yeah the, 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 the smoke. smoke fire yeah. so you like you light it and it like it sends off this blue smoke you see this in like protests a lot of times this is one of the first times i've ever seen this like during an electoral campaign for a really positive thing and they had an entire box and everybody had these like these little smoke firework things that were like firing it off and they're all in rows and they weren't sure exactly what to do with it they were kind of holding it up like this is really cool but there was no real chanting there wasn't like because it's all about the pictures and the image and it was also it's not just about their own pictures and image, but they know that by doing that, they're attracting the attention of the press and the international press. And all the international press was at this specific spot because they knew Bukele was going to vote there. So part of this is like, oh, wow, there's people doing stuff. Oh, wow, there's people cheering. Oh, wow, there's drums playing. Oh, there's smoke going on. Sweet. And so, you know, the press, including myself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. goes there because it's the money shot, yeah. you know. Uh, and so... This is just a couple of examples of like how we saw it just over the last couple of days. But this is, I think, so important understanding like the image that Bukele is and, and, and how important that is for like his administration, his government and his persona. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right, Mike. Like, I mean, you I also one of the things that I, I do want to mention here, because I think it's part of the sort of media image that Bukele is and the sort of illusion of, 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 of being a, a generous leader is also that he offered free transportation to many people to go to their voting centers, right? He also, uh, uh, the Nueva Ideas party paid for um, uh, Ubers and taxis to take people from places to voting centers. And so that, and all that stuff was branded, right? So there was a, there was a, there was a, uh, a piece of paper that said, Transporte Gratuito, you know, Gobierno de El Salvador. And Gobierno de El Salvador, Government of El Salvador, is also part of the rebranding. One of the things that he first did when he came into power in 2019 was rebrand all the, you know, sort of imagery of the government. So even, even Gobierno de El Salvador is a new formulation. That kind of dark blue with the, with the sort of silver text, that's a Bukele invention. And so it's, there's all these ways that um, his, him, his image, right, the, the, the persona around the image appears in different places. And to the Salvadoran who's using that public transportation to get to the voting center, right, there's, there's influence there, right? The, oh, wow, how generous of the, of the president, right, to, to help me get to the voting center to vote for him. Like, so this is, this is sort of the, the part of, the, part of the, that brand that Bukele has cultivated, not only through Nuevas Ideas, but through 
the, the, the image of the government itself. Not even to mention the, the food baskets that were handed out in recent weeks, right? Exactly. And those food baskets had the, the brand too. It said Gobierno del Salvador, uh, Paquete alimenta Alimentario, you know, and so this is, this is all, and that's only possible because he has uh, uh, all, all the, the state apparatus to do that stuff, right? To really kind of go to every door, go to every neighborhood and touch people, you know, with this box and deliver it, you know, like, and so that, that, that in itself is um, part of the inequality, right? And I think one of the reasons why having an incumbent run in El Salvador was, was also disallowed, because that allows for just an overwhelming amount of influence and presence that would not be afforded, right, another candidate. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to get into his speech, but just a second, I want to there's, I mean, there's an amazing podcast I've been listening to. Everybody has been listening to recently. Bukele, uh, what is it? Señor de los Sueños, right? Yep. By Radio Ambulante, El Hilo. And it's this new, I think what their, their joint podcasting company, this is the first one from them, is like Central, right? Mm -hmm. Central. So it's a Spanish language pos podcast, six episodes that walks from the very beginning of Bukele up till now, it's fantastic, it's amazing. If you speak Spanish, you should be listening to it. Check it out. Um, but I, I, I mention that because part of what they get into that is, is his marketing and his image around um, saying yes, building hope, committing to stuff, promising lots of things, but then not necessarily fulfilling. Yeah. Uh, you know, And that's what we've seen like when he was at uh, Nuevo Cuscatlan, that then later on the mayor, and then obviously I was interviewing folks just a few days ago, and there's been all of these promises to redo all these parks, and in many parks around the city of San Salvador, it's like halfway done. Yeah, and they're then, boarded up. Right, and so like, how, how, do, how, does, how does that fit within all of this, where like all these promises, all this image, getting everybody super hyped up, getting really excited about it, but not necessarily um, following through, except of course in cases like, for instance, uh, security, which is so huge, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I think there are other things, right? Like another thing that I think he delivered on that people are grateful for are, for example, some improvements in roads, mm. right? Uh, surf city, right? All these kinds of things. But if one looks really closely at those things, they're not geared for the ordinary Salvadorans. They're not. They're not kind of. They're not focused on them. They're focused on uh, tourists. They're focused on you know kind of income coming from abroad, and so there's so those things have been uh, also part of what he's been successful at and what he's delivered on. But right? it's so, also but like all that. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, that, but all that has also been the image, right? Because there's, I did a story last year, in in what was supposed to be Bitcoin, what was it? Bitcoin City. Bitcoin City, which is down. Um, oh God, I don't remember the name of the of the town, but it's right along the coast. Yeah. Right, and uh, and it was the like the first spot where there was supposed to be the pilot project and it was going to be amazing and it was going to bring all this Bitcoin money and you go down there now and you talk to so many people and they're like, look, yeah, there are places that accept it and it's, it's brought in some tourism because there's people that come in from abroad that like this, but it hasn't done almost anything for us and we don't even use it, you know? So it's like, that's part of the marketing, but not necessarily has it even really worked or not necessarily do people use Bitcoin all over the place, but that's like a marketing tool more, like you said, for folks from abroad who see that, oh my God, because now El, El Salvador is ground zero for like the libertarian, mm -hmm. you know, dream or goal of, of, of a libertarian paradise, yeah. right, in El Salvador. Yeah, no, exactly. I think Bitcoin's a perfect example of the, the promise, right, of transformation that these ideas, these new ideas will bring to the country, but the, you know, lukewarm effect that they have on society. Um, and so and I think it's really clear with the Bitcoin thing. Um, but, you know, so sort of going back to these other, uh, you know, things that he's clearly done, part of the, part of the marketing, that, you know, the marketing effect of Bukele has also been the media machine that, like, lets you see these things from perspectives that you don't usually, mm. right? And so this is the drone imagery. This is the, uh, you know, very kind of curated shots of, of the development and the bustling activity at them. Very kind of manicured, you know, sort of images that, again, just, uh, you know, add to the mystique of how Bukele can get these things done. Right. And so this is uh, this is what he's doing uh, with those projects. And there are many unfulfilled promises. Sure. Right. There are many. But when you talk to people, when you approach them about this, they're like, I don't care. Yeah. What I care about is the fact 
uh, that you know that I'm feeling safe now because right they also see that the unfulfilled promises part which you know is a is a um, um, is a problem right because there's so many of them um, and that in some ways it's it's a really unsustainable rate at which he's promising these things um, Salvadorans actually see that as very similar to what other governments did so in that sense he's not that different right right because there's always um, uh, promises that governments past have given people fix this bridge help with the sewer system um, uh, uh, increase the water pressure in our home so that we actually can get some out of our tap right all these kinds of things um, that are still a problem and Bukele has simply kind of promised them again right yeah plus he's so cool Right? So cool. So like, cool. I mean, aviator glasses and his hat backwards. Uh-huh. And uh, so, I mean, that, that's part of the, the, the mystique, right? That he's like, he's young, he's hip, he's religious. Like he, he like checks all the boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, he's super cool, you know? Like, why wouldn't you like him? Yeah. I mean, the guy, like you want to be his friend, right? You want to be his friend. You want to hang out with him. You want to go to the club with him. You know, you want to have a beer with the guy. Like, he's got that sort of effect on people. And, I mean, what, another thing that he's also really been deliberate in, in, in doing is presenting his family mm. as the model family, right. as the model Salvadoran family, right? Like you said, Christian, young, innovative, innovative, innovative um, dynamic, right? Uh, uh, brave, right? This, this kind of family. Um, and where the woman is very, playing a very supportive right, supportive role uh, to, to his leadership. Um, the way that he's also used that uh, uh, sort of familial narrative that he's cultivated through social media is also part of this, right? And yeah. that's how, you know, he's able to reach um, older folks. That's how he's able to reach, you know, people with more traditional sensibilities, uh, with religious backgrounds, right? This is the way through the family. The family is just another instrument in the media toolkit of the Bukele project. Right. <laughs> right. And informality too. Like he, every one of his like ads, his lives, he's like sitting on his couch with pictures of his family in the background, you know, wearing jeans and like a long, a tight long sleeve shirt. And just like, as if you're like looking into his house, the, the, when you, when you get off the international airport and you walk out of the main gate, it's so weird. <laughs> you, you walk into this, like, it's like you're in their like living room and it's like, there's a big seat for Bukele on one side. And then there's a big, you know, seat with his wife on the other, and it's like the presidential family, and you could almost, you could, just, you could almost feel like you'd walk up there and sit down with him, you know? Exactly, and I think that you know that sort of intimacy that they're trying to curate uh, uh, around the family is also part of what people are be are drawn to. That that's I feel like that's part of the populist approach that Bukele has taken, right? To to really reach people where they are, even though it's very it's an empty thing, like they're, you know. Ordinary folks aren't going to Casa Presidencial to, you know, make claims on the state and ask for things like that's not happening. Yeah. But he's but he's really cultivating that proximity to people, which people have, uh, you know, sort of really fallen for. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, we're going to have to wrap things up here. Jorge, walk us uh, to Bukele arrives. Uh, what's the scene on the ground and, and, and talk about his speech? So Bukele gets to, uh, I mean, he really milks the crowd for a long time. So he's just, he, you know, it's re- people are saying, you know, the reports are coming in that he's going to pop out at 10, that he's going to, you know, sort of walk down the, the red carpet to this balcony at the National Palace to speak to the crowd at 10. He milks it a little bit and he makes people wait, you know, to the, so it crescendos a little bit. Just like he did with the elections, right? He didn't, he didn't vote. Most, most presents you vote, vote first thing in the morning, yeah, right? exactly. Get it done. He does it 20 <laughs> minutes beforehand and people are waiting for him all day long. Yeah. And so he does this, right, to the last moment just to kind of, you know, juice it, to juice it a bit. And, uh, and, and when he comes out, you know, it's, that's when you have the smoke machines going nuts. You got the, the spotlights kind of, you know, going on a kind of crazy erratic pattern. Um, and the crowd is going wild. Bukele, Bukele, Bukele. Right, this is what you hear people saying. Um, and uh, it's, it's also, I, I think the sound is really important at this thing. Um, uh, in the sense that, like, his microphone is so loud. Mm. It's just you can't ignore it. Mm. I'm wearing noise canceling headphones trying to sort of like protect my eardrums and I could still hear the guy crystal clear. Um, it's, it's just so intense, the, the, the level of sound. But 
but the people are simply like they've been they've been waiting for this you know they've been waiting for this he pops out with Gabriela right um, uh, um, uh, his wife and um, and he just he he just waving at the crowd you know giving a thumbs up you know pretending that he knows somebody in the crowd hey I see you you know doing all these kinds of things um, and the people are just soaking it up right this is this is the this is the moment right this is the sort of climax this is what we've we've campaigned for right this is what we want and and it's and it's really really clear um uh and so what i what i will say too about like the way that bukele then begins to talk about his speech the 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 crowd goes quiet the crowd it's 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 really still it's really still and 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 he begins to you know begins his speech which is um really kind of rehashing of many of his tweets right that are against the opposition against the journalists such as yourself mike right against these people who are the naysayers of the bukele project and it's almost that the, as if the guy hasn't won like he's a he's a sore winner and it's super clear in the way he's you know he's he's going after these people even before he begins to talk about the positive things about you know his government that the people voted him uh, in for right and so it's it's kind of strange that it really begins in the negative, right? So you have a, a good kind of 15 minutes of him just railing against the different oppositions, right? Who doubted him, who, you know, who said that, you know, he's a human rights abuser, journalists that are coming to the country only to, to criticize and misunderstand and misrepresent, right? Um, as well as even drawing in these weird concepts about colonialism and imperialism, which is part of the the thing that he does, right? And why he's so savvy and dangerous in many ways, right? Um, in, in pulling metaphors, mixing metaphors from different political traditions and, you know, and ideas and synthesizing them in a way that, you know, uh, uh, gets the crowd going, right? And makes, makes the crowd uh, feel like they're the protagonist in all of this. Talk about um, what he said about democracy, because he brings it up several times. He brought it up during his, uh, his press conference, right? And then he brought it up again, because obviously there's been a huge number of critiques uh, and major concerns about weakening democracy in El Salvador. Uh, and he kind of takes it and, and, and spins it, which I think is, uh, is, is really important for us to understand the way that he's seeing it uh, and the way that he's trying to kind of connect with the, the Salvadoran population about what this means, right? Yeah, he, he spends a good amount of time breaking down the concept of democracy in the speech by actually splitting the word to its sort of Greek origin, right, of demos and kratos. And he says that the demos is the people and kratos is power, yes? So power to the people. And this is where he, again, doubles down and that sort of messianic, you know, millenarian kind of thing where he's that vessel of God and the people, you know, um, uh, illuminated by God as well are, uh, are, are pushing him to do these wonderful things to El Salvador. And so he's, he's actually splitting the democracy uh, conversation and, and, and putting and kind of putting it upside down in a way where like this is if this is a dictatorship it's sort of I think this is the, co the continuation of what he what is a subtext of what he said, right, that if this is a dictatorship, as the journalist will say, right, then it's a dictatorship of the people, yeah. right? And so, and even that has a sort of Marxian thing there, but he's using it as a way to justify, right, what, what he's doing and also to dismiss the critiques that have been happening and have been taking place and the ones that are to come. And so he's trying to kind of anticipate where the, the conversation will go, right, and trying to nip it right at the beginning. And so he's using, you know, even these terms like democracy and just imploding them and rebuilding them and recomposing them in a way that suits, you know, what, his, what, his, what he's doing. I thought it was really interesting the way that he, um, I think in his speech, he's talking about how he was responding to a Spanish journalist yeah. who had said, aren't you like, why are you trying to destroy democracy in El Salvador? And that's the point in which he says, no, 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 the democracy that we've had is actually a colonial like implantation it's failed right and so what we're building is our own uh, from below salvadoran democracy and it's going to be different uh but it's ours and he's able to, to play with that like exactly what you were just talking about jorge he's able to play with that because he comes back to this oh power to the people well look 
you guys just voted me in with 85 freaking percent of the vote. The, the, the country with the highest vote percentage ever in the history of the world, according to him so far, we don't know the final results, but that, you know, we know that he had a huge amount of support. Uh, and so that is obviously a major mandate for us to do it ourselves, you know. Of course, when he says us, he really means him. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Right, and then like people are gonna support him because, hey, look what I've done with security, you know. But I think it is, it is this fascinating twist on how he's trying to, in a way, co-opt the, uh, the, the language of democracy in, in a different way for his own means, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and not, not only does he do the Spanish, but he also does the Americans, right? He says that the Americans right. were part of the way that this democracy unfolded and that led to the last, you know, uh, 20 years of ARENA and FMLN, right? So he does that as well. He goes back to the colonial period with the Spanish and the Spanish journalists, but then he ends up saying, you know, we love these guys, you know, they're great, we appreciate them. And so he kind of moves back and forth, the harsh critique and then this present stuff. Um, and, but at the end of it, what, you know, you said this, that, that, that he's, he's, a, he's trying to assemble in the discourse a Salvadoran democracy from below, right? Um, and, he, and the way that he, that he sells that is by saying that, you know, this is a path that we've never been allowed to take, right? Right, a path that we've been never allowed to take because uh, the NGOs, because of the U.S., because of you know all these sort of legal systems, right, of which democracy is a part, um, have uh, encumbered, right, the true El Salvador from coming through, right? And so now, you know, being that he is this vessel of, of transformation, right, he's going to be the one that breaks through this, right? Uh, and so. Th and that is, uh, is a, such a seductive thing. And that seduction is so clear in the way that people respond to that. That's when you have bukele, bukele, again and again and again, right? When those lines are delivered in this kind of, really kind of incredible cadence that the guy has, this, this sort of rhythm by which he speaks, right? Where the repetition sort of line up, maybe kind of, you know, as if he's like actually there's an underlying beat to to his music to to the to the, to the speech that he's making, and leads to, to 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 the line where people just go nuts, right? And so this this is this is this is really powerful stuff, and also in the way that that you know, those powerful lines actually are addressing the problem of the Salvadoran self-esteem, right? That's the reason why it's also seductive. It's not only because it's really well presented, it's really well curated, you got the light show and the drone show and the fireworks that are forthcoming. No, it's also because Salvadoran self-esteem has been historically low, right? Because of the way they've been presented in, in world media, uh, you know, gang members caged and things like this, that he's offering this new vision, right? And that new vision is uh, obviously engineered and manufactured, but is nonetheless very compelling um, and remains compelling. And dangerous. And dangerous. What, l let's, let's look at the future. Where, like, where are we at now, right? That was yesterday, we still don't have uh, I guess where are we at now, but then where are we headed, right? Because, you know, where is this going? We still don't have uh, the full results. Uh, so we don't know in particular about Congress, Legislative Assembly. But where do you see this taking in this in his second administration here? Yeah, I always tell people that I'm not in the business of predicting the future, um, you know, <laughs> or, or even really talking about the future because you it's, it's, because yeah. you never know, right. right? Because you never know and it's not it's not safe to do so. But what we can see from this this moment uh, right now is that I mean, we know in, for certain actually where we're going. Five years of Bukele, that means more state of exception. That means more uh, 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 presence of the military and police. That might also mean the um, uh, construction uh, a boom that El Salvador has been going through, um, uh, which might mean actually uh, more prisons, right? It might mean other the, these kinds of experimental projects like Bitcoin, right, things like this. So you might have more of that, you know, um, uh, yeah, kind of sort of quasi-innovative populism that he's, that he's um, uh, prototyped in his first five years. So we'll have a continuation of that. We'll have more promises, right, that are likely to be unfulfilled, but this is unsustainable, right? So we'll, I think the, the, the breaking point may come in the next five years. I don't want to say for certain, but um, uh, I do hope, right, that sincere hope that there, there is an increasing awareness of that the dismantling of, 
uh, the democratic state is, is, is a problem um, that needs to be uh, addressed and that a one-party state is not a solution to these really deeply rooted and historical problems of this country, that no single politician on his own, even with right, loyalists all over the state, will really be able to fully, fully address. And so that, that, that's kind of what I see in the next five years. But I mean, you saw Felix Ulloa speaking in the New York Times saying that like, you know, maybe there's five more after that. Yeah. Maybe there's five more after that, right? The, the con- Felix Ulloa, vice president. Felix Ulloa, vice president. Um, and, so you, and so maybe, maybe we're going to a, a sort of Ortega kind of situation where you have perpetual reelection with you know, phony Mickey Mouse opposition that he's going to knock down every time, right? And maybe the FMLN, as the, I think they were seven percent the last time I checked in in the in the um, presidential uh, tallies, um, might be the only opposition, the real opposition left. I mean, even Arena and and some of these other parties were already sort of doing this. They actually represented this kind of weak opposition that Bukele will just very easily uh, tumble down, but it maintains right the the image, the semblance of a democratic system because an opposition is allowed to exist, right? And so that, that is precisely what for sure is going to, I think, be the case moving forward. Um, but I think people and social movements will emerge to, in response as well, as we saw with some of these crazy memes that were circulating on the internet. <laughs> Jorge, I want to just go really fast um, <clears throat> to the bigger international perspective thing. Um, I, was, I was fascinated that I was out near one of the polling stations where Bukele was about to vote, and these guys come up to me and like, oh, you're press, we're from Peru. Uh, one guy's a right-wing politician, another guy's the head of the municipal police, um, 50,000 police officers, and he's like, they're like, we're here to learn the Bukele model, and we want to bring it back to Peru, and it's going to be happening more and more around the country. Bukele even mentioned yesterday that he's been in conversations to help uh, Javier Millet in Argentina learn the Bukele model or the state of exception model, uh, at maybe around economic stuff, maybe not so much security, but around other layers of this stuff. So he is an inspiration for many right-wing leaders and, and will probably be increasingly so. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's not just and not it's not just now as well. Like after the state of exception, even before Bukele's team was doing uh, delegations to places like the Dominican Republic, right to places like Colombia, to think about you know security policy uh, in those co- specific contexts. So this has been you know kind of an ongoing thing, these sort of missions, these punitive missions, right? Um, that that these that this government has taken to to spread some of the ideas that they've that they prototyped and sort of field tested in El Salvador, right? So, and I think that's part of it, part of the seduction for other leaders that are also experiencing uh, high levels of crime, narco trafficking, right? Um, all these kinds of issues and, and human rights abuses as well. Um, and so that's, that's part of the seduction. And the other one being that, like going back to him being so cool, right? Is, is, is that, like how, how do we sort of craft a figure within you know our our national context that has the staying power and this incredible amount of popularity that will then allow us to do these other kinds of sort of technical changes in constitutions and legal frameworks that then will make possible even will open up new new vistas right for far right politics and so that is you know part of the danger of of Bukele and and he leans into this too like even in the speech Right. He he highlights Argentina. He highlights Ecuador. Ecuador is the first the first country that he mentions in the string of countries that he that he speaks about. Um, and that's, you know, that's Novoa, state of exception. Right. Um, and uh, also Honduras as well. Right. With a state of exception next door. And so he's he's really he's really kind of savvy in this in that as well. in the way he's he's recognizing the the folks who are, uh, you know, also paying him some level of adoration. Mm-hmm. Right. From from abroad. Yeah. Anything else to add, Jorge? You always ask me this, and I never know what to say <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like we've covered everything. No, I mean I think that like part of part of the challenge moving forward with all of this is um, what what is an opposition in uh, in a in a state in a perpetual state exception in an authoritarian 
a consolidated authoritarian uh, political reality? Like, what is an opposition? And that's a question that we don't have an answer for yet. I don't have an answer for that. Um, uh, because of the exhaustion of other political experiments past and the residues of political errors of the past too that still cast a really long shadow on, uh, on, on politics in El Salvador and, uh, and on social movements. And so that, that is really the question. Um, if, if even an opposition, a real opposition, is possible right, in this new political reality, we don't know because we've never been here. Um, and, and, and that's, a, I hope, an answer that, you know, that we um, find by experiencing what these next five years will bring. Jorge Cuellar, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Let's do it, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yeah, man. I just have one more thing to say before I go. All of that was the situation the day after the election, Monday, February 5th. And as of right now, there's still no official result from the Supreme Electoral Court, which oversees the election. On the court's website, the presidential vote count is stuck at 70% of the ballots counted. On Monday afternoon, members of the court held a press conference to announce that there was a problem with the uploading of the data of the remaining votes and that they were going to have to double check everything manually. I'm seeing reports now that it could take at least a week. Opposition parties and electoral experts have denounced the situation. It is not normal. We've also heard many stories of problems with the vote abroad. All of that said, however, Bukele did clearly win the election. With 70% of the ballots counted so far, he has a resounding lead with 83%. But there is an even more concerning situation with the Legislative Assembly. Only 5% of those votes have been counted so far, and it's an important battleground. Remember, all 60 seats are up for grabs. Bukele says he's picked up most of them. But several people I spoke with in San Salvador over the last week said they were going to vote for Bukele, but not for his party in Congress. Like this taxi driver I met a few days before the vote. He told me, never in history have you seen one person with all the power and do everything well. We need a counterweight. We won't know until those votes are counted. That is all for Under the Shadow. Next week, we go to 1980s Honduras, to the center of US operations in Central America, and the people fighting brutal repression. That's next on Under the Shadow. If you like what you hear, you can check out my Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash MFOX. There you can also support my work, become a monthly sustainer, or sign up to stay abreast of all the latest on this podcast and my other reporting across Latin America. This is Michael Fox. Many thanks. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.